Well, thank you, Alon. Um, I assure you out there, I'm not your competition. Um, somebody got me a Twitter account, but I'm not sure exactly yet how to use it. Uh, but it is a powerful, powerful tool. And I would encourage you to uh, use it today and compete for that uh, $250 gift certificate. Um, so this morning, uh, I'm going to start out uh, with uh, a session that uh, we've called uh, Special Topics uh, in uh, Antifungal Therapy. Um, we've got two of these sessions. And actually, it's kind of interesting. I think as Pete mentioned, um, I mean, decided not to go on drugs per se. We had a little bit of that last night, but on some of the issues around therapy. Uh, and uh, so you'll see the next uh, few speakers talking on a lot of those issues. Uh, the first speaker um, is Oliver Cornley, uh, and he's going to talk on how do we follow responses to therapy. Uh, and this is a topic that we have to deal with all the time on the wards. We have to deal with guidelines, et cetera, et cetera. And it's not always easy to kind of come up with what's best for what condition, what organism, and stuff like that. So we thought it was kind of important to have uh, somebody talk on this, and Oliver is very kind to do this. He actually ha had to step in because our other speaker uh, didn't and wasn't able to make it. So Oliver... Uh, you were out here. There he is, and he is coming. So, Thank you, John. And um, now I understand why there was that last-minute change in the topic of my talk, which I just uh, detected in the program um, three days ago. So how do we follow response to therapy? That is a question that I really thought and hoped for that nobody would ever ask me, but um, because it's not easy to answer. Um, <clears throat> I work with many companies. It's usually on clinical trial design. That's likely one reason why I was asked to present on this. Um, so treatment initiation with the example of aspergillosis. Um, that's relatively easy and there are, there's consensus on uh, what defines aspergillosis and, um, and, uh, and, whether, when, or, and that defines when treatment should start. Um, it has been studied in trials for years and for decades. So, um, if it's clinical and, and not necessarily in a clinical trial, then you rely on these three. You have your host factors, the, the typical host, so to say, in this case, even with respiratory symptoms, which is not necessary to diagnose the infection. Uh, we have that mycological criterion and a clinical criterion. So, and these are so clear that you... Um, as said, find consensus, and there are even pocket cards where it's being explained for those who don't see this every day, but only occasionally, so that they uh, have a resource to, to uh, cling to. So, response to therapy should have to do with one of these three, at least, with clinical or with the mycological or with the radiological aspects. Let's go through some of these, and of course, this talk is not restricted to a specific um, uh, pathogen. So if there are examples, then usually there are. My first training is hematology, so there will be aspergillosis. Anyway, let's go through some of these symptoms, being aware of that they differ between diseases and between pathogens. So fever, for example, that's a fantastic one to follow because we can measure it. Yeah, that's, it that's great. We can even measure it two digits behind the decimal point. And um, so it appears to be objective, however, um, you can't measure it during the last days in California. I heard from JR that um, they were like 47 degrees, whatever that is in Fahrenheit, and that is everybody would have a fever. Um, and there um, uh, are downsides because it's, in the end it's unspecific. And unspecific actually is the, the header of the whole thing um, because unspecific, um, everything is unspecific with these fungal infections because we have so few uh, reliable tests that really um, tell us what the pathogen is we deal with. And then the antiparetics or, <clears throat> or iris as a halfway understood um, um, uh, thing, um, syndrome that, for example, happens with neutrophil recovery radiologically is deterioration, but the patient looks really happy. So the clinician says, well, integrates, nobody knows how, it's 
not artificial, it's natural intelligence then, integrates all the aspects of that individual patient and said, oh, your CT scan looks worse, but don't worry, you'll be fine. Other clinical symptoms, cough, you can't quantify, I would say. Um, dyspnea, okay, you can go by respiratory rate, which is okay. And it's organ specific, so that appears to be something that, that could be used. However, um, it's subjective, specifically the cough uh, is subjective dyspnea too, I would say, and it's difficult to quantify specifically for the cough. I mean, what is a uh, severe cough? And what, thank you for the examples uh, from the audience. Um, <clears throat> so what would you say is that on a, on a visual analog scale from one to 10? <laughs> um, so it's subjective, difficult to quantify, and then we have pleuritis and other symptoms. What we actually do um, is that we integrate all these symptoms and sometimes we even count the symptoms and say, okay, that person started with five symptoms and it's now down to three, which is, uh, of course, has its downsides as well. Microbiology. Well, we do have two tests, galactomannan, and we know that galactomannan slope, and it's a paper of Laura Covando, who's likely in the room, um, galactomannan slope by day seven, uh, is worth following because, well, if there was a positive GM at the beginning, so if there is a decrease, then that is associated with success, so we should use that. And it's massively underappreciated. It's not used a lot. We try to collect cases that were just treated clinically outside of clinical trials, and it's very difficult to collect cases because even if GM assay was used to diagnose, then uh, people tend to not run another test because they are, um, they are happy with knowing what they treat and so they don't follow it. Um, and they should, Laura says, and she's right. Because if there is an increase, then it's a higher risk for death. We don't know how to uh, react to that increase, but it's one way we should really use following uh, treatment success in aspergillosis and maybe in some other diseases, the one or the other fusarium uh, where um, GM is positive, there it could be used as well. And we have better deglucan slope, decreases, uh, it's associated with success in invasive candidiasis and candidemia, so that can be used and should be used there. A paper from Lewis Group um, is um, um, enough, so to say, evidence to, to follow uh, the BDG slope. Imaging. That is more often used in mold infections, of course. Um, some exceptions, like chronic disseminated candidiasis or other yeast uh, infections and, uh, that cause deep tissue infections, but most often used in mold infections. And we are not clear about the timing when, the, uh, when it should be done to follow treatment, so I love to do it on day seven and then weekly uh, CT scans. It can be low dose and, and you don't need uh, contrast. And uh, but that is, there is no consensus whether day 7 or day 14 should be uh, the next CT scan after the one that was used for diagnosing. And that one that was used for diagnosing might be five days old until Galactomannan came back and, and we understood that there is aspergillosis going on. For staying, stay with a moment for a moment with, with imaging. Lesion size is the one thing that you should look at. But what does that mean? It sounds good, and you can easily read over, oh, lesion size, okay. But then um, it's expected to correlate with outcome, of course. And I already said, like, when, when ANCs recover, then you have that, it might be iris, it might not be iris, but whatever, it's increasing lesions, although the patient is improving. Some of these patients, if the lesions are large already, and then invasion of neutrophils follows might die because of that, uh, of, of that um, actually desirable immune re uh, reaction. But just technically, lesion size, you could measure the longest diameter, and that is what is being done in oncology, that's where all this comes from. And you can add up all the diameters of the different lesions, all the longest diameters of the different lesions. I, I guess that nobody does that, I think. Uh, it has been discussed. You can go by area, so um, millimeter, whatever, 
I'm not good in these mathematical expressions. Is it square? Or how do you call this? MM2? Square? Square millimeters? Okay, great. Um, I promise I know how it's, uh, what the German word is. Okay, so. <clears throat> so it's again the same thing. Area of lesions and total area of all lesions. We are currently using this in one clinical trial and it is not making things easier actually because in the end you're sitting there with a calculator and <laughs> try to understand what is a so and so many percent decrease, what does that mean for the for the area and what does it mean for the for the longest diameter so that you can more easily uh, get hold on what's happening. And then there is cubic millimeters. That should be the best. The volume of all lesions. That should be the the ideal, I guess. The problem is that you don't necessarily know when you look at a CT scan what is a lesion and what is part of the lung and what is something old and has nothing to do with, uh, with the ongoing fungal infection. So none of these are easy um, <clears throat> and, and there is no artificial intelligence working that you can just click on a box and say like, oh yes, well, click on that button and you get the total volume. That doesn't exist, so um, you have to do it by hand. And it gets funny uh, logarithmic scales with cubic millimeters from 10 to whatever, 10 million, or is that I don't know how many zeros there are. Um, but apparently, in this only study that I know of, where it has been done, weekly CT scans and then all the volume of all the lesions, um, it, um, it tells us that those who will survive versus those invasive aspergillosis patients who will die. You can tell them apart already on day seven, some, yeah, for certain on day 14. But you see on day seven what's happening and it predicts more or less what is happening on day 14 and then down the road. And you see that the darker um, uh, box plots stop earlier because that's the patients who died. So there is a volume increase from day seven to day 14 that predicts outcome. And uh, I can tell you it's not being used in any clinical trial that I know of currently. So clinical trials, what, they, what do they use? We all um, use, Bram Siegel is the first author of these definitions of the EORTC MSG criteria for response. But if we briefly look at these, there are two categories, success and failure, and then there are subcategories, complete and partial success and stable progression and death or the failure. And if we go by the core criteria, so it's, it's more text there, and it's, it's, it's not easy to project, that is why I reduce it to core. Resolution of all attributable symptoms and signs is complete, um, defining a complete success. And then there are variations for the individual uh, diseases and fungi uh, causing these diseases, because it's of course different for crypto versus, um, versus aspergillosis versus uh, candidemia. Resolution of all symptoms and signs and resolution of all radiologic abnormalities. That means that you can almost never reach it if you are treating um, extensive aspergillus, extensive pulmonary aspergillosis, then it will never go away completely. So there is that compromise of more than 90% reduction in lesion size, uh, which is currently being used. And, and you can go through all the list with the same, um, uh, with the same, uh, and, and facing the same issues. Improvement in attributable symptoms and signs, that's the one where we then count six symptoms and now it's only two, so that's improvement. But it might be that the cough is, uh, um, well, that the symptoms are not all equal. And, uh, and it might be that the fever is gone because of an antipyretic. So it's difficult. It's, um, uh, it's not mathematics, actually, although we can measure a few things. And I'm not going through all the failure categories, um, but one thing's clear, you need a data review committee to, uh, to evaluate in a clinical trial the, the outcome. You do not necessarily need a DRC to judge whether a patient really has the disease which is being studied in, the, uh, in, in a clinical trial. It helps, but it's the, the evaluation towards the end, so how to follow the response, that's more important. Or well, there's more uh, discussions. 
So the DRC determines the response to therapy. That's good because you can um, give the responsibility to, to that group. And it uses the response categories defined in the study protocol. Easy. Anybody would say, yeah, of course, that's what they do. However, the frequent issues that data review committees evaluating that response to therapy face are a long list. And for the response criteria, for example, these are not defined by FDA or EMA, and that is why the 2008 paper from Ram Siegel and, and colleagues is so important, because that's where the definition we, we um, refer to. But these response criteria differ between trials, because sometimes it's not right into one of these categories, but it's somewhere in between, and you have to integrate all these different things like clinical, radiology, mycology, and so we, what we usually see is that there are additional categories being created. I mentioned the complete radiological response with more than 90%. It's actually somewhat uh, diverse what you do with 50 to 90% and with 25 to 50% reduction in lesion size, which is all positive and good and clinic, clinically I, I like it to see in my patients. Um, but it might fall into different categories than when evaluating response in a trial. And there is no categories like presumed eradication and presumed persistence. You find them in the clinical trials, but you don't find them um, in the uh, original definitions. Imagine a patient where diagnosis was made through BAL and then there is galactomanan positive in the BAL. You're not going to do weekly BALs to see when the patient responds, but you will do serum be, be a, a serum uh, galactomannans, and they might always be negative from the start, uh, which is usually the case in a breakthrough on, on uh, prophylaxis. You would, you would uh, base the diagnosis my, mycologically on BAL fluid and not on the, um, on the, on the blood values because that, that blood um, GM optical density index will be uh, negative in most cases. DRCs have to deal with many missing values all the time, no symptoms reported. Well, that can be then uh, asked, uh, the site can be queried, um, but there might be no imaging done. And then you're there, no imaging, but you still should evaluate whether or not. And, and, and the, the site might say, well, clinically that was not indicated. And likely they are right because the patient felt good, everybody felt good, no fever, whatever, everything better than yesterday. Uh, less pale in the face, so you don't go for the imaging. And there might be no mycology done as um, the, in the example that I just mentioned, um, BAL positive, serum negative, follow up only from, from serum available, and, uh, and BAL, and that is even worse, would then again be performed if there's clinical failures <laughs> and that, that, uh, that doesn't make things better. <laughs> Tricky cases in DRC work. AML patient with emphysema and cough and no fever. BAL galactomannan positive is enrolled into a trial for pulmonary aspergillosis. And then on day 42, which is one of these usual time points where you want to evaluate what the response rates are, uh, there might be a resolution of all the radiologic abnormalities, except for the emphysema, of course, but the infiltrates are gone. And, uh, but there is no additional sample being taken, so it might be a presumed eradication only, and the only symptom which is left is dyspnea. Dyspnea is left, and it might be that you can't call this case a complete response because there is still a respiratory symptom. And then there is the discussion that, of course, it's emphysema, so that patient likely always had dyspnea, but it was not actually captured uh, at the beginning when the patient was enrolled because it was just normal for the patient, didn't, didn't complain and it, uh, it wasn't um, uh, appropriately um, taken. And maybe dyspnea is not every day the same in these patients. So in the end, you of course rely on the three pillars for response, the three that, that, that cause treatment and that, that trigger treatment and it's the same three at the end of treatment, clinical, signs and symptoms, often unspecific, difficult to quantify, sometimes the number of symptoms used as some sort of a surrogate marker, 
radiologically, measurements borrowed, I wouldn't say stolen from oncology, um, maybe less appropriate in IFI, don't know. And mycology prone to missing values, and then of course with all the other caveats that the few tests that we have, uh, how they, uh, how they, uh, how good they are in the different um, uh, diseases and pathogens, and invasive procedures cannot be done sequentially, of course. And in summary. I did this. I did these things. Okay, you need. Uh, it's not very precise, so it's some art in there, and you need three chefs who integrate. Um, well, sometimes there are some vegetables on top of these fruits. Thank you very much.